So continuing with, with what we've got here now, so attention in the back please, we're getting started now. Um, we are going to edit here now. So the, this was the point of, of putting in that plugin. See, now I've got the colors also. So we edited those couple of lines there. Notice this index HTML file is pretty short. It's only 42 lines of code. And how does everything else work? I don't see anything listed here about the glow and, that's, and that sort of thing, right? So we'll look at what else we have here. At the very top, we've got uh, a big old section about the license, that this is licensed under the Apache software license, etc., provided as is. Um, this is without warranties or any conditions of any kind, express or implied. Basically, this, here's the code, here's the software, you're, out, you're on your own, and, and so forth. So, Notice because of the uh, because of the plugin we have code collapsing, so you can you have a little minus symbol where it sees that some code starts and ends. So this is optional, of course. But if you want to close that license part, you know there's a lot of a lot of code in your way there that you might not want to look at. You can close that, and you are able to close the different sections, kind of like a Notepad. You know if you're going to deal with a just a section. So browsing from the top, we should see a lot that is familiar, and then a few things that are not familiar. So this is a, um, an HTML5 compliant document. That's what line one says, doc type HTML. It's HTML5. Then there's a license. Then the HTML document actually starts. Notice what's different in Eclipse is that if you click on a tag, it, it does highlight the beginning and ending tags in a different color, and it also highlights on the left side here from beginning to end. So if you click on head, for example, it highlights the beginning and head tags, and here's everything that's in that section. So it's different than uh, the notepad, but similar. There's a head section. And then meta car set UTF-8. We talked about that last time, but briefly, this is defining what our character set is. What is the range of, of, uh, of text that we can use? We can use English letters, Spanish letters, like, you know, the O with the uh, with the dots on it and all of that. We can use uh, Cyrillic letters, Cyrillic alphabet, like Russian and so forth. Uh, we can basically use every language, uh, every, every uh, alphabet, UTF-8. Then we've got two very interesting lines here, line 23 and 24. And I have to look up exactly what meta name format detection telephone no means, but from my research it seems to be that the old way of creating a mobile friendly um, project was to add a meta tag to say form detection and telephone yes, which was that we were running a project on a telephone, but that standard seems to have not one and instead other more modern standards one like CSS so notice here we're saying format detection telephone. No, it's not a telephone. Well, yes, it's on a telephone, but we're doing it in a better way. So we're saying no to that standard. Uh, line 24 should look familiar. This We saw this when we were looking at uh, jQuery Mobile, but this is a little different. We've got meta name viewport, and viewport is the, the screen. What are you looking at? What, you're, what are you viewing at the viewport? It's the screen, and we've got some properties some attributes, content, user scalable no. This is what prevents people from zooming in and zooming out of this web app. It's a website, but it behaves like an app in that I cannot zoom in and zoom out. You can't zoom in and zoom out on, on Facebook or Instagram or Gmail or anything. It's the right size for the right device because it scales. So here, user scalable no. Initial scale and maximum scale and minimum scale, one or 100%. We saw this previously. I think we've only seen initial scale. But here we've got maximum and minimum. So you cannot zoom in or out more than 100%. That's good. Then we've got device width, or we've got width equal to device width and height equal to device height. So that's how this is stretching out to fill your device's viewport, so that it stretches out to fill the screen. And then you've got actually here a deprecated element, which we're going to remove. At, at the end of line 24, after the comma, there's something that says target 
density DPI equals device DPI. And this is deprecated. It's no longer that necessary or useful. What this was supposed to do is take your project and scale it and take advantage to the density of your device. 300 DPI, 360 DPI, whatever, and it was supposed to look perfect. And in my experience in testing it myself, I don't like the results because on my virtual device, Apache Cordova and everything looks nice and big, like it takes up more of the space on the screen. And on my real device, it's smaller. I have a lot of empty, wasted re screen real estate. And that's because of that attribute right there. So we're going to remove it because even the latest versions of um, the documentation say this has been deprecated. So go to the end of that line, line 24, and you want to delete that, including the comma, so that that line ends with height device, height equals device height. I'm going to save that, and if you want to run it and see the result, this will uh, make more sense or more of an impact on your real device. Uh, I do not device, I with, with it turned on. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Without it, I'm sure now, better results. So removing that old tag, even if you don't have a real device, I would recommend you take it out just like we did here so that it looks better on the devices. It's actually filling up my screen pretty well. Um, are you sure you didn't delete the final quote? Okay. So, good point there. Um, be careful about what's being deleted. We don't want to delete that final quote and everything gets messed up. So that was line 24. And then uh, line 25 is a reference to a style sheet. We'll explore what's in that style sheet in a moment, but that's inside of the CSS folder. Then we've got a title, which says Hello World, which actually doesn't matter. We're not going to see a title anywhere in our project. There is no title to display. It, it, it's an app. So on line 26, to save us a few bytes, we should take that out, because we're not really going to see that anywhere. So between your title tags, line 26, remove hello world. We'll put whatever secret nefarious message you want. No one's going to see it. But can you remove the title too? You could, but I believe the HTML5 specification uh, wants title to be there. So I would recommend just empty it, but leave it for compatibility. So no title, and then the head ends, and then the body begins, and that's not too much actually. Then there's a line 29, which is a div class app. So it's got a class, it's got some CSS attached to it. We'll see where and, and what it does. And then an h1 with our heading number one, we've seen that. And then another div, and that one's got an ID and a class. ID device ready and class blink. Now, just because this is named blink doesn't mean it, it's a command that makes something blink. This is CSS, and there's some sort of rule somewhere that, that is called blink, and it explains what that means. So there's no phone gap or jQuery mobile or HTML class called blink. It's a, it's a construct that was then defined. There's a blink tag, but we don't speak about it anymore. <laughs> or marquee. Or marquee. So line 32 and 33 display this message. And what happens here, we'll see this actually elsewhere. This has got a class, and it says event listening. Wait a minute, there's a space there. And I've always said in, in these classes, when you write a class or an ID, don't put a space. Why is there a space here? This is actually two classes that are that we're mentioning at the same time. We may, we can mention more than one class with a space, not a comma. And we we sometimes need to do it. This is kind of advanced here. And what's happening here is 
there's a class event and listening. So there's some CSS or JavaScript that deals with that, that defines what's happening in this p tag. It's a plain old paragraph. What's happening with this when it's on event listening? And what's happening when it's on event received? And we'll talk about what listening and received means in a moment when we look at JavaScript. A div ends and then another div ends and that's the, the app, div class app. And then we've got a few references to JavaScript. Line 26, make a note is one of the most important lines of all. Uh, a reference to Cordova.js. That is what translates what we learned at the phone gap documentation to something that the device understands. Without that line, if we write the code exactly as the example tells us, it will not work. Because there's no translator from that JavaScript to what it actually needs to be in, in Android, in Java, or Objective-C on iOS. So line 36, you have to have that line in any project that you are working with that is an HTML project that you're going to turn into an Android project. This activates all of the features of PhoneGap slash Cordova. That's what I'm saying. We're going to see both names, PhoneGap and Cordova. So that line right there. Line 37 has a reference to an index.js file. And that one is just um, extra definitions for this one project. That's not necessary like Cordova.js. We're not going to need to have a JS, an index.js file, but Cordova.js, we definitely need it. On the previous class, when we set up the functionality of our app to allow people to, to write their name, remember it says, please enter your name. And when we write John and click OK, it automatically puts the name John in a bunch of screens. You know, take a class, John. Here's a math class, John. And it knows that because we did some JavaScript and uh, something like that is sort of happening here in that we're initializing, we're running an initialization function that makes things happen, um, sort of like what we did with, with uh, entering our name. Remember at the very end we had um, show the name throughout the app when we launched the app. So we'll see where that's coming from in a moment. Initialize is actually not a built-in uh, JavaScript command. We, uh, it's constructed. So I'm going to save this. And we'll look at other aspects of the project. Uh, let's look at the harder one and then the easier one. Uh, we hardly ever need to open Cordova.js, and I would say never open it. There's really no need to get into that. It's like, you know, opening up the engine of your car. Uh, even if you know what you're doing, in JavaScript, I don't really recommend opening that up and working with it. It's already fully defined for us. It's, a, it's set up. You just use it. So we're not going to open Cordova.js. But let's take a, a look and poke around what's inside of index.js, which is found inside of our JS folder. Now be careful here. Don't double-click it, because it'll want to open in the built-in JavaScript editor, which might not be defined on these computers. What I often see that happens is if I double-click it, it wants to open in Dreamweaver. I got Dreamweaver on my home computer. I want to edit it in Eclipse, though. So right-click, open with text editor. So now we've got two tabs, the index.html and the index.js. This index.js comes with um, comes with Cordova, and basically here's where we're defining what this little example app does. And I'm gonna I'm gonna mention a few things that are that are useful for us to know. Um, but basically, notice we got var app equals, and then everything else in the curly braces. So this is um, this is um, we're defining all aspects of the um, of the project here. The biggest one we need to care about is listed on line 29. Document.event listener. 
that is something that only makes sense and is important when we work with phone gap. Because at the very core of phone gap, what happens is in order for us to write any JavaScript phone gap code and for it to work, the device needs to be ready and accepting those commands. So it's always a good idea to have a document.event listener um, to test is the device ready. If it is not, then we should not use any of the code that we're going to learn at phonegap.com because it won't work. The device is not ready to accept that code yet. Now usually accepting or, or being active and ready to run happens right away even on like my older Android 2.3 device. That's sort of there as a fail-safe in case something happens and the device is not ready to accept the commands. That's why this has, what do we do if the device is ready or what if it's not ready? Device ready is defined Well, let me back up. We have right here, bind any events that are required on startup. Common events are load, device ready, offline, and online. The device itself, these things are really complicated. There's these, these are little computers in our pockets, and they're doing stuff all the time, even if we're not using them. We'll look at a screen in Eclipse that tells us that even when I've got it laying down right there, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's contacting the cell tower. It's checking how much battery it has. It's doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes. One of the things that happens is, once we load our project, either we're going to get you know, a, um, an answer that the device is ready, that the device is offline, that it's online, and then once we get that answer, once that event happens, we can do something. So here we've got, we're waiting for an event. We're listening for an event. Possible events are load, device ready, etc. If we do get the device ready event, then we're going to run on device ready function, which is defined over here. That further then updates the screen to represent what happens once the device is ready. Um, we've got line 40, uh, 45, received event dot set attribute style display block. Display the text on the screen, device is ready. If it's not, it won't display. Um, if this wasn't ready, my bar there would be gray. It would be the, the text that we wrote that said, please wait. So if it never loaded up properly, it would keep saying, please wait. So this is built in for us. It's just a sanity check if this is all working. This index.js, I regard it more as a sanity check. I'm not really going to, we're not really going to use it. We're going to do it slightly differently, but we are going to use an event listener device ready eventually. Because, for example, remember with the map um, on the previous month's project, right away it asks, what's your location? Well, what if we wanted to take a photo, but for some reason the camera is not functional? So we want to check if those things are available to us, and that's what this event listener device ready would be doing. So we're not going to change anything here. This is just for your information, index.js. It just works. What we will look at and change is the CSS file. Remember, um, I have to look up exactly what they define that it is, but from the way it's constructed here, you know, it's... Um, an application constructor, so I have to get back to you to see exactly what it is. So let's look at index.css. 
if you right click open with CSS editor. Alright, so here we have uh, 116 lines of code which focus more on the design of the project. Uh, again, there's a license up there. Then there's, um, there's a CSS here, a wildcard, asterisk. And that's saying dash webkit dash tap highlight color uh, invisible. Notice RGBA, A for alpha, so this is what color is 000? zero zero? Black. Uh, an absence of color. Black. If it was 255, 255, 255, it's all the colors, so it's white. This is black. But then we've got zero here, so it's transparent black. Well, what is this doing? Make transparent link selection. Adjust value of opacity there. What this is saying is because we are using actually a website, sometimes a behavior could happen that when you tap something, it highlights like when you tap on a link on a website. So what we're saying here is make that highlight color invisible, specifically for WebKit browsers, which include Chrome, um, Safari. Um, so, and here, asterisk means basically apply to everything. So make any stray highlights, if you highlight something, make it invisible so it doesn't look like a website. Then we've got body. What are aspects of the body that we're defining? And notice we've also got some specific WebKit uh, commands. WebKit touch callout none. Prevent callout to copy image, etc. when tap to hold. So that's saying that if you tap to hold, this is normal text, normally, if you tap and hold that, you would get a pop-up, a call-out that says copy it, search, you know, whatever your call-out would give you. We're saying none. WebKit text size adjust none. WebKit user select none. So some other things to prevent website behavior. Background color. Look at this. We've got a section in 27 to 38 that defines our default background color. We've got line 27, which is the basic um, color, a gray. E4, E4, E4. It's a gray. Uh, I see a subtle gradient, however. Slightly darker gray at the top and slightly brighter gray at the bottom. Linear gradient. There it is. From top to this gray to that gray and then several other ways to define how the gradient would look. Covering the, um, the standard set forth by the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, and then the version for WebKit browsers, the version for Microsoft browsers, and another version of WebKit. So to play with this a little bit, I want to see what happens if I'm going to deactivate some of these lines and then change one of them and see what we get. Uh, I'm going to see. I'm going to deactivate lines 29 through 37, and by deactivate I mean let's comment them out. Here we use the slash asterisk type of comment. So go to line 29, the beginning here, and type slash asterisk. <laughs> That's going to start our comment. Everything gets commented out. And then we want to stop the comment on line 37 at the end of line 37 after the sad winking face. Asterisk slash. <coughs> Actually, that's ending our linear gradient. But asterisk slash. So 29 to 37. I'm turning that off because, uh, first of all, we're not on a Microsoft browser. I'm not on a Microsoft phone. So line 30 is probably worthless for us. Uh, line 29 and 30 have a difference. Line 28 is supposed to be the official standard way to write gradients. We'll see if it works. But uh, just to kind of play with this, line 27. On line 27, let's choose any other color. Remember, we can choose real names here. I'm just going to type gold, whatever. I'm just going to type a name of a color without the pound sign. Take out the pound sign. Just type gold. 
And then uh, line 28, I'm going to make up some colors from here as well. Top, a color, zero, and then to a color. And I believe we can write here regular words, but I'm first going to write just a hexadecimal color, just something obvious. FF0000, that's four zeros there. And then 0000, zero, zero, zero FF. So from that color to that color, we've got a blend of colors. Uh, what color is that color? Anyone know? Red. Bright red. What's that color? Bright blue. Let's see what happens. Save your file, run it on your device. Don't forget to save. Let's see what happens. What I recommend before you run it is um, whatever your current device is, go home first to wake it up. I usually go home, home screen, and then run it. So you're either going to get gold or you're going to get blending colors. I got gold. Who got blending colors? So anyone got the blending colors? Gold, okay. So what could happen is maybe we need the WebKit, li the WebKit linear gradient. So I'm going to move the comment from 29 to 30. I'm going to say comment out starting from the Microsoft gradient down. So move that comment from 29 to 30. And in that linear gradient, we'll put the same colors. FF, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then 0, 0, 0, 0, FF. Okay, there is Red to blue. So right here we're just sort of seeing we've got a default color if the if this CSS is not recognized, that CSS3 stuff. If it's not recognized, it falls back to just a plain gold color. But we figured out that here on our uh, on our Android devices, if we use the the code of uh, this format WebKit linear gradient, then it obeys it. So any questions? It would not work for yeah, so does that mean that we don't need line 28? Because 29 is easy to do it on this device. On this device, that's a, that's a good way to say it. On these devices, it seems to work. So to fully be compatible, if eventually I was going to release this to iPhone, perhaps linear gradient line 28 would work. So I would want to test it. Although uh, most likely, uh, because uh, both iPhone and Android do use a version of WebKit, it might, it might need WebKit. That's why we want to test it more. Yes. Why do you need um, both of those colors? I'm only getting blue. Um, confirm that your code looks like this, and I'll I'll take a look. We need both of those colors because it goes from from one color to another color. There's a blend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
All right, so uh, remember in uh, the previous month's class, we went to a really cool website where we made, uh, where we can make uh, gradients. We're going to do that right now. We've, we've seen here in the code, this is where we can go to, uh, to change our existing colors, and uh, we can kind of fumble around with colors here, but instead we could use that cool website to make our perfect background color and then plug it into our code. So let's take a little uh, digression to the web, to a web browser. And uh, as I said, I don't remember the, the, the address, but I'm going to do a quick Google search for Ultimate CSS Generator. So do a search, Ultimate CSS Gradient Generator. To search for ultimate CSS gradient generator, and you should then get a result over at colorzilla.com. What we'll do there is we'll we'll look at a pre-made uh, gradient, or we'll make our own gradient. We'll tell it give us the code, and then we'll plug it into our CSS, so that we have a new a new background. So go there. Let's say I like that purple color, but I want it different than that because the color ends right in the middle. You can you can edit these colors. You can drag these sliders, and it'll create a brand new result. So I can do something like that. So you can either choose a color or, or make a make a gradient, and then this is the code that it gives me. <coughs> then it's a matter of taking this code and pasting it into our project. Technically, we don't we don't need it all, 
because uh, it is mentioning, for example, uh, Firefox and um, Internet Explorer version 6 and that sort of thing. So I will uh, I'll copy the code. If you hover over, you'll see a copy button. I'm going to copy it, we'll put it into the code, but then we'll, we'll fine-tune it. So I'll copy that back to Eclipse, and I'm going to remove uh, everything between line 38 and 27. Yes, usually that is, uh, that is related to the background color doing it if it's done on, on certain types of gradients. Because we don't have any um, we don't have any picture actually being attached there. We have a gradient that it's attached. So I'm going to remove that old code, just delete that, and I'm going to paste the new code. And so here it pasted way too much. I'm going to clean out a bunch of this stuff. Uh, for example, line 34 to 43, that says filter, prod ID DX image. That's like an old, old style to do gradients that only really worked on Microsoft, old Microsoft browsers. So I'm going to delete this whole chunk that says filter to that uh, curly, to that curly brace. Or is that too far? Should go yes, not the curly brace. The curly brace would uh, would end the body. <clears throat> I'm going to delete the last one. Filter down to with 100%. Notice the way this shows it is that the linear gradient gradient is at the end, the official W3C standard. Then there's the Microsoft gradient. There's one for Opera, WebKit, Mozilla, and then a plain old one. Before I make any more changes, if I do, I'm going to save and run this and see if it's actually looking like I envisioned. get an interesting gradient back there. It's like like bars or something, doesn't yeah, you it? Get that too. Yeah. It ends at a certain spot. Probably if I play a little bit more with my generator here. Um, All right, so obviously we can keep playing with that, but um, I'm just showing you here that we um, we can add our own colors and such. Now, depending on your device, either testing on real or virtual, you know, it may take a little while. So here's a time saver that could help. Since since the result of what we're looking at, every time we we run it, even if we're on the CSS file, it runs, it goes to the index. Remember in Notepad, when we were working in the JavaScript file and we hit run, launch Firefox, it would, it would run the JavaScript file. The behavior is there's some code somewhere here um, that makes the index file always load up first. That's what we want. That's our first page. So the index file is what is loading up in, in the device. 
we can preview that index file in Eclipse as if it was a website so that we can see again some quick results instead of waiting for the device to load. So if you right click your index file and select open with web browser, it'll open with Eclipse's built-in web browser with these pop-ups that you want to cancel. This is getting confused in that this uh, this stuff that's loading up here um, is specific to PhoneGap and it expects to run and make sense on a device or a virtual device. If we force this to want to run on a web browser, it gets confused. So I'm going to cancel this. Probably get two of them that pop up. Look at that network status. There's no such thing as network status in a web browser. Cancel that. And then app show, cancel that. So any of those little pop-ups that happen, just cancel. <coughs> and the result is here that it loads up like a web browser. Hey, that's that connecting to device. That's that please wait that we wrote. Because there's we canceled those, we canceled those those pop-ups. It never loaded up like a real device. That's why we're seeing here the actual you know welcome message. And here it's gonna keep saying the connecting to device because there's no device. And the point of this is simply, well, sometimes we just need to see these results quickly in a web browser. Eclipse has a built-in web browser. And since my screen is kind of stretched out horizontally, it also is behaving like a horizontal view. Notice the side-by-side. -side. What you can do in Eclipse, look at this, if you click and hold the tab, click and hold and drag it to the right at a certain point, it's going to want to resize itself into these quadrants, like that. So I can see like a little viewport there, and then my code over here. So if it doesn't seem to react right away, just keep, and keep dragging it and holding it at a certain point. When you get to an edge, you'll see that it snaps to the edge. What I like about that is that you can uh, edit some code. Save it, and then your, your web browser here has a refresh. Refresh that. You'll have to cancel this stuff again. I don't, don't click OK because it seems to crash everything. So you want to cancel that, and then your results show up right there. So that might be faster than loading it up on a virtual or real device. So there's still more of the CSS file we're going to look at. Um, look a little bit more at it, and then we'll take a break. So there's that part about the body and setting the, um, the color. Then there's something that says dot app. That's where class div app, uh, no, it's div, it's div uh, id equals, uh, div class equals app, right here. We're defining some properties of it, like background, URL, image, logo, no repeat, etc. That's that logo right there, the little, the little um, Cordova mascot. We're defining it inside of the image folder, logo PNG, which is right here. In the image folder, there's a logo PNG. That's how we're showing that picture. So if we wanted to show our own picture, we could do a couple of things. We could put our own picture there. Let's, let's say I called it myimage.jpg. And then what I would do is edit my code to point to myimage.jpg. Or what I could do is I could put in my own picture and replace the logo PNG because the code is already written pointing to the right picture. Just put my picture and replace it.
there's a few spots here to edit what does it look like if you are on a vertical orientation or a horizontal orientation regarding margin and padding and such listed over here If we're on landscape orientation, there's uh, some things going on here. If, we're, if this is being displayed on a screen and the aspect ratio is this and the minimum width is 480, um, uh, 400, which usually means, you know, landscape, that's how we're changing the orientation of things. That's how it moves to the side. If you want to change things, you've got our values here, margin and padding. Here's where we're defining our H1. That's pretty standard, font size, etc. We've got dot event, and then dot event dot listening, and dot event dot received. This is what defines that text that appears, either that it says waiting or, or, or welcome. Uh, here's listening as we're waiting for the device to load up, it's going to be gray. It's going to blink gray. That's what we're seeing here, background color gray. Once we've gotten the, once we fully load it up, we have green. There's green. How do I know? Look at this. This is cool with Eclipse. If you hover over a hexadecimal color, it should, you should give you a pop-up preview of what that color is. So if you write your own color there and hover over, it's that color. The color of the text itself, notice it remains white, but we can edit that here on line 74. The text color is white. The font size is 12 pixels. So if I want that larger, I could put 22 pixels. But actually, what did I say on the previous class about using hard values like that? We should avoid it. We should use percentages because 12 pixels might look pretty big on an older device, but 12 pixels might be small on a newer device. So let's change line 75. Instead of font size 22 pixels, we can do percent, like 75 percent. That'll be 75 percent of the, of the initial font so it'll be smaller. And if it's on a big device, it'll still be smaller, but not 12 pixel size small. The final lines here, 90 to 105, define how does the little blink work. He goes from a certain color to another color. And here's the cool part, line 103 and 104. How fast? Right now it's saying 3,000 milliseconds, which means the whole cycle of going from one color to another takes three seconds. So 1,000 milliseconds is one second. If we want this to, to fade even slower, we can write 1300 milliseconds. I'm going to write it in both because, or well, 13,000, because uh, it's two possible ways to define how it animates. Here I'll be sure that it's, that I've covered the basics. So if you want to try this just for fun, line 103, 104, I've changed it from 3000 milliseconds to 13,000. Very slow. I'm curious to see how that goes. You can either Save it and refresh your web browser. Remember to cancel those things or run your, your device. Look at that. Really slow. It takes 13 seconds. 
seven and a, or two, six and a half from halfway to one color, six and a half halfway to the other color. Or the opposite, you can make this really fast, such as 300 milliseconds. There's 300 milliseconds. You can't not see it now. It takes 150 milliseconds from one color and 150 milliseconds to the other color. 300 milliseconds in total. Okay, so if we, uh, we've got this far, good. Uh, let's take one last break, 10 minutes. When we come back, we'll look at some more stuff, and then we'll have the lab time. So it's about uh, 8.31. We'll be back at 8.41, and we'll go on.